Lightroom is a complex application and can be configured in multiple ways. For a lot of us, many of the default preferences and settings are fine, while others of us may like to tweak and customize. If you're a tweaker, feel free to play with all the settings. For the rest of us, there are a few preferences that I want to point out so you can make sure you have them set to your specs. I'll start with the Preferences menu by going to the Edit menu and selecting Preferences. In the General tab, you can modify a variety of preferences to your tastes, such as language and sound effects, but most important are the Default Catalog and Import Option settings. Let's start with the Default Catalog. Understanding how a catalog works is the most important element in Lightroom. In the next segment, I will be covering everything you need to know about catalogs. But here, this menu lets you select the catalog that opens when you start Lightroom. Most users will only have one catalog, which makes this setting unnecessary. Under Import Options, you have some choices for what Lightroom does when importing images. If you want the Lightroom Import dialog to automatically open when you insert a memory card, then check the first box. If you check the second box, Lightroom will select the Previous Import folder, which shows you all of the images just imported in one group, even though they may reside in more than one folder in your folder structure. I don't use any folders generated by my camera, so I leave the third box unchecked. The final box is for people who may use their camera to record both a JPEG and a RAW file for each photo taken. If the box is checked, Lightroom will import both JPEG and RAW versions and show them next to each other. If the box is not checked, it will only import the RAW file. Moving on to the Presets tab. Under Default Develop Settings, checking the Auto Tone Adjustments box will allow Lightroom to automatically try to recover highlights and shadows in the develop settings. I prefer to make those types of adjustments myself. Checking the second box will allow Lightroom to apply automatic adjustments when converting to black and white in Lightroom to try to optimize the black and white image for you. In the develop module, it's possible to change the Lightroom develop defaults. Checking this box means that Lightroom will keep separate default setting changes for different cameras and apply them accordingly. This can be helpful if you use multiple cameras and you use different standard develop settings with each one. Checking the fourth box is similar to the previous box, but it makes Lightroom apply develop default changes based on the ISO of the image. This is useful specifically if you apply specific noise reduction amounts for images taken at different ISO settings. I'll talk more about changing develop defaults when we get to the portion of the tutorials covering the develop module. The buttons in the Lightroom defaults tab allow you to reset or clear out any presets or templates that you might create in the various Lightroom modules. More on that later as well. For me, the external editing tab is the most important one in the preferences to get right. This designates the file type, color space, and bit depth that will be applied to any RAW file that is opened for editing in an external application. The first section designates the settings for the version of Adobe Photoshop you will edit images in, if you own a version of Photoshop. I open my RAW images as TIFF files because they retain all image data and support Photoshop layers. But PSD files also have this capability and are a fine option as well. I apply the ProPhoto RGB color space because it maintains the greatest amount of color information from the RAW file for editing in Photoshop. I personally recommend using ProPhoto RGB instead of Adobe RGB or sRGB. However, using ProPhoto RGB does mean that you may later need to convert your images to Adobe RGB for certain printers or sRGB for viewing on the web. It is always possible to downsample to a smaller color space. However, if you start by converting the RAW file into one of the smaller color spaces first, you can never get back all the colors available unless you open the RAW file again with a larger color space. 
I also recommend assigning the 16-bit per component bit depth for smoothest color and tonal transitions in your images. If you use the Profoto RGB color space, then it is essential to use 16 bits to avoid color banding. However, 16-bit image files are twice as large as 8-bit files. Resolution refers to print output resolution, and that can be changed at any time, so I generally just leave it set at 300 dpi. For compression, I use none, but there are arguments to be made for using the LZW compression mode. In Photoshop, I recommend setting its working color space under Edit Color Settings to match the color space that Lightroom will open files as. In my Photoshop, I have my working color space set to Profoto RGB. The additional external editor section allows you to make the same choices only for a different image editing application. This could be a different version of Photoshop, for example if you maintain copies of both Photoshop Creative Cloud and CS6, or for another application, in my case one called PT GUI. In the file handling tab you can designate settings for how Lightroom converts RAW files to DNG files. I don't personally convert any RAW files to the DNG format, but if you do, here's where you can choose how Lightroom will do it. The only other section of much consequence in my work on this tab is the camera RAW cache settings. If you frequently jump back and forth between multiple images while viewing RAW files in Lightroom, increasing the camera RAW cache can speed things up by holding the RAW file preview in memory so it doesn't have to re-render it each time. I do this sort of image jumping back and forth a lot when evaluating images and making adjustments, so I have increased my cache to 20 gigabytes. The Interface tab has a bunch of settings that allow you to adjust how Lightroom looks and behaves. I'll let you play around with those on your own and find out what fits your taste. When you're done with the Preferences dialog, it can be a good idea to restart Lightroom to make sure that all of your changes have been applied. Next, we'll look at some of the catalog settings by going to the Edit menu and selecting Catalog Settings. Again, if you're not sure how catalogs work, we'll be covering catalogs in depth in the next tutorial segment. In the General tab, you can get up-to-date information about the Lightroom catalog that is currently open in Lightroom. As I said before, most people will only have a single Lightroom catalog. In the backup section, you can indicate when Lightroom will create a backup of your catalog. It is important to have a backup so you can restore your catalog if it becomes corrupted. I manually backup my catalog to a separate hard drive regularly, so I only have Lightroom generate a backup once a month because it also reminds me to optimize the catalog at that time for best catalog performance. If you don't create a manual backup like I do on a regular basis, then you should probably have Lightroom backup more frequently than once a month. In the File Handling tab, you can adjust the standard preview settings. All the images you see in Lightroom are actually previews of the images saved in the Lightroom catalog and not the actual images themselves. There are three different preview sizes. Minimal are the thumbnails, standard are the ones that fit the screen, and one-to-one -one are the size used if you zoom in larger than screen size. The standard preview size you choose can be determined by your monitor resolution. For example, if your monitor is 1920 pixels on the long side, choose the next bigger resolution from the list, which would be 2048. Since the previews you see in Lightroom are all JPEGs, the quality setting is a JPEG quality setting. I find that a medium setting is a good balance between not letting my cache get too large and still having adequate image quality. Every time you zoom into an image larger than the standard preview, a one-to-one -one preview is generated. You can also have Lightroom build one-to-one -one previews at any time. Lightroom will be more efficient if one-to-one -one previews are already saved in the catalog instead of needing to rebuild them each time, but they can also make your preview cache really huge. If hard drive space is limited, you may want to have Lightroom discard one-to-one -one previews every day. If you choose Never, Lightroom will store all one-to-one -one previews indefinitely and your cache can eventually become really large. 
I find that retaining one-to-one -one previews for one week works pretty well for me. Smart previews are a new feature in Lightroom 5. If you have Lightroom build smart previews, you will have the ability to take your Lightroom catalog with you, say on your laptop, and still be able to edit and output your images even though the actual images are still at home on a different computer. Of course, smart previews take up even more space on your hard drive than not so smart previews. Finally, let's look at the metadata tab. Checking the first box enables Lightroom's version of autocomplete. Essentially, it will suggest completed keywords for you as you begin typing, like many word processors and smartphones now do. Most important are the next two boxes. If you only ever plan to view, browse, organize, keyword, search, sort, or open images from Lightroom, you could potentially leave both boxes unchecked. This will mean that all metadata changes and develop adjustments will be stored only in the Lightroom catalog. This can have some performance benefits in Lightroom. However, if you open those images outside of the Lightroom catalog, say an Adobe Bridge or another computer, none of your metadata or adjustments will travel with the images. By checking those boxes, metadata changes and adjustment settings will be saved in the image file, in the case of JPEGs, TIFFs, and PSDs, or in an XMP sidecar file, in the case of RAW files. This allows all changes and adjustments to travel outside of your catalog with the images. That ought to about do it. All of the settings we didn't cover you can go back and fiddle with on your own if you like, but the ones I covered are the main settings that make an important difference in the way Lightroom behaves or how it handles your images.